welcome God's presence to come. thank you for your goodness today. Lord, we thank you for your mercy and your grace. And Father, today we invite your presence to come and fill this place. As we gather together in your name, we thank you for the promise, Lord, that you manifest yourself to those that love you. So Jesus, we ask you for a manifestation of your presence this morning, that you would come and touch every life from the oldest to the youngest, that your presence would rest upon each one of us today. We bless you, Lord. We invite you into this place.
Bible says, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven. That means your sins have been removed as far as the east is from the west. It says he remembers them no more. Now the question is, why do we keep remembering them? Right? If he's removed them, why do we keep pondering over them? So I was reading a scripture this morning just kind of blew my mind when Paul was speaking to the people at the Colossians. He says, you are made complete. We look at ourselves and we think we're a mess. But see, the Father has looked through the blood of Jesus, through the effects of the cross, and is looking at you forgiven, accepted, free, and complete, and made whole. See, that's how the Father sees us. But oftentimes we look at us in our shame, through insecurities, our weaknesses. So when we look at ourselves in a in those areas of our life, even though they are real, that, that we do struggle in some certain areas, we end up struggling in life. We do not allow the light of God that's within us to shine. See, the enemy has tricked us in certain ways to think, well, 
I have, I'm not worthy. I, I've done some bad things in my life. And what happens is the light does not shine. So we need to have a different perspective and see through the Father's eyes that you and I are complete. We are made whole. Our sins are forgiven. See, when you and I take communion, it's, what it is, is it's a reminder of the cross. It's a reminder of the fact that you are whole. It's a reminder that you're made complete. That's why maybe we should do it every day in our house. Because what it does, it's a reminder. See, the Bible talks about reminding doing things to remind ourselves. See, the, the Jews celebrated holidays. They did a lot of things in remembrance of what God did, right? So you and I got to constantly remember, because if not, life will try to beat you up, right? And other voices would come in and speak negative, negatively to you. But how many know that when we keep reminding ourselves of the goodness of God, the mercy of God, it refreshes us, it keeps us healthy and whole. So I want to encourage you today. Be mindful of what God has done and remember who you are in Jesus. Amen? Amen. 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 Good word, Garrett. Let's just practice that for a moment. Why don't you put your hand over your heart? Let's just declare that over ourselves today. Say this with me. I am complete. I am complete. I am whole. I am whole. And I am forgiven. I am forgiven. Come on, one more time. I'm complete. I am complete. I am whole, and I am forgiven. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. If you'll remain standing for just a moment, we're going to move right into communion. just want to give you a little instruction. If we can start with the back rows first. I'm going to ask you to move out to the outer aisles. Come up, grab a cup and a piece of bread, and then come through the middle aisle and return to your seat. And once everybody comes through, we'll begin. So back rows, if you'll come first, and everybody just follow in line with them.
Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. I'm going to ask Daniel if he would bless the bread today. body of Jesus given for you. Let's eat together. Paul said in the same manner he also took the cup after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it. In remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Garrett, would you bless the cup today? Father, we just thank you for the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from all unrighteousness. We remember today. We remember today the power of the blood. We thank you for the effects of the power of the blood in our lives today as we are free. We thank you for your sacrifice. blood of Jesus shed for you. Let's drink together. Hallelujah. Come on, just thank you for a moment. Thank you. Thank you. Lord, we thank you that in you we are made complete. In you we are made whole. And in you is forgiveness of sins. And we thank you today, Lord, for the blood of Jesus that washes us white as snow. That though our sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Lord, we thank you for your body, which you gave freely for us. Lord, that by your stripes, we are healed. So, Father, today we declare healing, wholeness, forgiveness through the body and the blood of Jesus. We thank you for your death, Lord. We thank you for your resurrection. And we thank you that we are raised with you. We're seated with you now in heavenly places. Lord, that your resurrection was our resurrection. That your death was our death. That your burial was our burial. But we're raised into the newness of life through Jesus Christ. Lord, we bless you today. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Come on, let's give the Lord a hand. Jesus. We bless you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God's good. Come on, when your winning team scores the touchdown, or the big guy hits the home run, come on, what do we do? We cheer, right? Hallelujah. Well, Jesus won the greatest victory ever. Yes. Death, hell, and the grave is defeated. That's right. And we have newness of life in him. Amen? Yes. Come on, let's give him one shout of hallelujah. Ready? One, two, three. Hallelujah! Bless you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Why don't you take a moment, turn around, greet a few people around you there. God bless you.
Zion, Jojo, you guys want to help me? Amen. I don't know about you, but I'm excited for 68 degrees today. The trees are blooming, the grass is growing. I uh, want to thank everybody that showed up last night for our little cleanup time. I think we had a little bit more fellowship than cleanup, but, uh, but it was fun. So thanks everybody, and thanks everyone who brought some food, and we had a good time. <clears throat> what time are we coming for the Easter egg hunt next Saturday? It's just 9, 9.30. Yeah. Uh, next, we're g- I'm going to make an executive decision here. So uh, next Saturday, if, if you're going to help, uh, be here at 9:30. We don't like to. We like to s- sleep in on Saturdays. So. Uh, anyway, but that's more than enough. So 9:30 next Saturday, um, be here. No don't. Are we having donuts? We are now. We are now. Daniel's bringing donuts, apparently. <laughs> yeah, not the not the cheap giant packaged ones either. Sweeties, calling or something. Anyway, maybe there'll be donuts. I don't know. Well, we're going to continue worshiping uh, with our giving. So if you want to take out your offering. We're going to bless it today. <clears throat> oh, doesn't it feel good just to get in the presence of the Lord and let things kind of be good? Amen. Let's just uh, declare a blessing over our giving today. Just pray this with me. Father, I thank you that your word says that if you would not withhold your only son, that you would also not withhold any good thing from me. So today as I give, I'm thanking you in advance for the good things, the great things that you're bringing into my life. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Go ahead, guys. Thank you so much. And uh, kiddos, you guys can go out with <clears throat> Rose and Miss Emily today. <clears throat> For those of you who are staying, the other half of you that are staying, uh, If you want to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 21. I said said years ago the church should grow younger and not older. And I, I think that we're seeing the effects of that with our children. Some Sundays we have more kids than adults, and that's perfectly fine with me. Because how many of you know one of these days they're going to be the ones up here doing everything? So let's train them while they're young. I'm getting a little ahead of um, the events of this week, but that's okay. As you know, Palm Sunday will be coming up in a couple of weeks. And then, of course, we'll be celebrating Easter But this morning, I wanted to start with the story of Palm Sunday and extract some uh, information from it and look at what was occurring at that time. So Matthew chapter 21 and verse number 6, it says, So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and they brought the donkey and the colt and laid their clothes on them and set him on them, And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna! 
to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? So the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. Let's pray one more time. Father, we just thank you for your presence, and we thank you for each and every individual that's here today. And we thank you, Lord, for what you want to release to us through your word this morning. So, Father, we ask you that your Holy Spirit would come and lead us into truth, that your anointing would rest upon your word today and rest upon the hearers of your word today. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. So we know the story. Jesus sends his disciples to uh, go and get a colt, a young uh, donkey that had never been ridden. This is, of course, Palm Sunday, the triumphal uh, triumphant entry when Jesus enters in to the city of Jerusalem. And it's interesting that they call it a triumphal entry. I don't know if you have a study Bible, but at the top of my chapter there, it says the triumphal entry. It's interesting that they call it that. And, and I guess there is some truth to it that when Jesus actually entered into the city, there was a great celebration. Uh, the Bible says all, all of the city was moved, the entire city was there and they were celebrating the entry of the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee whom they knew to be Jesus. But when Jesus enters into the city, instead of this uh, outbreak of revival and outbreak of joy and outbreak of peace, Jesus immediately goes into the temple. And when he goes into the temple, he discovers there at the temple that there are things that are occurring there that may have looked godly, but they were completely outside of the nature and character of God, and they were not a part of the kingdom of God. And so we know that Jesus, the Bible says, he fashions a whip. In other words, he actually sat down and premeditated and thought about what he was going to do. It wasn't spontaneous. It was something that he thought out and he enters back into the temple and he begins to uh, turn over the tables of the money changers and he begins to chase out the thieves and those who were stealing. And he says, "You've, you've made my house a den of thieves, but it's supposed to be a house of prayer. Now, you would think that with Jesus' triumphal entry and all of the city being there and the people bowing down and worshiping him, that this would have been a revolution, so to speak. Uh, This would have been a revival that would have happened in the church and that all of the people would have understood Jesus is here and He is setting things straight. Jesus is here and He's demanding a response to His presence. He's demanding that righteousness comes back to the house of God. He's demanding that we change the way that we're doing things. He's demanding that we repent and that we turn back to prayer instead of using the house of God as a means of financial gain. But you understand that that's not what happens. Instead, the opposite happens. The Pharisees and the scribes and those who were in charge of the temple, they get offended, they get angry, and then just a week later, we find Jesus on the road, uh, the... uh, uh, I'm trying to think of that old Amy Grant song, Via Della Rosa. We find him on his way to the cross instead of on his way to exaltation and praise from the people. And see, this is what I understand. That revival demands a response. That the presence of Jesus demands a response on our part. And as a pastor, I've seen it time and time again. The Holy Spirit begins to move. Uh, There's an anointing in the room. The presence of God is in the room. And I've seen it many times where when that moment comes and the presence of Jesus saturates the room, there's a response from the heart of the people. And some of the people run to the front and some of the people run to the back. Because we understand that the presence of Jesus demands something from us. See, you cannot remain the same in the presence of a holy God. 
It's like when Isaiah uh, sees his vision of God and the train of his robe filled the temple and the first thing out of his mouth is, Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips and I'm from a people that's, that's unclean. Woe is me, I can't stand in your presence, God, because you're holy. And unless you change something about me, I'm not going to be able to remain in this place. But the angel takes the tongs and he brings the coal over to Isaiah's lips and he touches his lips with the coal from the altar symbolizing uh, purity and cleanness that only God can give to us. See, when we enter into his presence, there's something about us that, that has to be changed. There's an awareness that, Lord, I'm not worthy to be in your presence, but God has shed his blood so that each and every one of us can stand just as Garrett said today, complete, whole, and forgiven in his presence. See, most of us in this room would say, yes, Lord, we want to see revival. We want to see uh, a manifestation of your presence. We want to come to church and just experience all that you have to offer. But what we have to understand is that with all of that actually comes a response out of our own heart that, Lord, there's still some things in me that need to change. And it doesn't matter if you've been a Christian for three years or 30 years. I would dare say that no matter how long you are a believer, there will always be things in your life that still need to change. Paul said that we're pressing on toward perfection. That the goal is perfection. But I don't know about you, but I'll be the first to say, Lord, I know that I am not perfect. And my wife would second that. But see, the presence of Jesus actually demands perfection from us. The presence of Jesus actually demands that we make a change in the way that we do life. Make a change in the way that we even do church. I know that your background is maybe different than mine and all of us here in this room. You know, I think we have the weirdest church in the world. I, and that's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. But we have so many different people from so many different backgrounds. Some of us have a very conservative background. Some of us have a very liberal background. And some of us are somewhere in the middle. And then we just all come here and we do church and family. And I, I think it's great. I love it. It's fun. Most exciting time. But what we have to understand is that just because we experience something back here in our background doesn't necessarily mean that that's the way that church should look like or should function. And to be honest with you, I don't know if this is what church is supposed to look like. I think church is supposed to look like Saturday night, last night, where people show up and they just bring food. I mean, that's church right there. That's revival. <laughs> yeah, I didn't even ask for it, wasn't expecting it. I show up and there's a table just full of good food. Homemade pizza, fried chicken, oh man, some kind of salad dressing that Sylvia had that I just wanted to squirt the bottle right into my mouth. Yes. Oh my gosh. I told Levi, I said, Levi, I don't know how you're so thin with a wife that knows how to cook like that. <laughs> I think that's what church is supposed to look like. I think church is supposed to look like family. But see, there's a different atmosphere that happens when we come into this room, come into this place. And you understand, this is not the sanctuary. We are the sanctuary. This is just the room that we gather in, where the living stones come together and we are creating a house for the habitation of the presence of God. Why do we do what we do? Well, my, my primary focus and my primary attention is to draw in the presence of God. Maybe we sing too many songs, maybe we don't sing enough songs, maybe worship is too long sometimes, whatever the case may be. But I want to tell you that the whole focus of what we do is that we are drawing attention to Him. You see, we have this idea that worship is about us. That if they don't sing the song that I like, or they don't do the thing that I want them to do, then I haven't really experienced worship. But you understand that worship has nothing to do with you. It doesn't matter if you went into some state of ecstasy this morning. What matters is that the name of Jesus was exalted and that we worship the King of Kings. 
Because only that will draw His presence into this place. Only that creates an atmosphere for His, for his presence to be exalted and welcomed. And see, I've learned that without the presence of Jesus, that there's no change that takes place in our lives. And I will dare say that there will be people who go to church today all around our region and all around the world who won't experience His presence. And without an experience of His presence, there's no demand on our lives to actually change. You understand that one of these days we are physically going to stand before the Lord. I would dare say that none of us will be standing. I would dare say that it's going to be pretty hard to stand. <laughs> but you know, all of us are going to stand before Him. We're going to be there face to face. And there's going to be a demand from our life. What did you do? How did you live? What did you do with Jesus? Did you know Him? Did you not know Him? Did you make Him known? But how many of you understand that it's better to have that experience now than then? It's better to experience the presence of God that demands a change from our life and yield to that demand than to have to do it on that day. And this is exactly what happens in Matthew, what we just read. Jesus enters into the city, and all of the city is excited. You know, people get excited about revival, and there's a good, there's a good reason to get excited about revival. But how many of you know that even in revival, you can still just go through all the motions and not really have a changed life? And see, this is what was occurring. Jesus comes, the people get excited, they heard about Him healing the sick, uh, opening blind eyes, the lame walking, they heard about his reputation, and now he's there. Here he is, in the flesh. And they begin to worship and sing Hosanna and lay the palm branches down, and there's a great celebration. But just a few moments later, when the presence of Jesus demands a response from the people to change, there's a counteraction that takes place, and it's that action that ultimately puts Jesus on the cross. Now see, we know Jesus was headed to the cross. Let's not make a mistake about it. We know that that was his ultimate goal. His goal was to die. But you understand that it was the response from the people who actually put Jesus on the cross. Jesus said, nobody's going to take my life from me. I'm going to freely and willingly lay it down. But we see the Pharisees and the scribes, and I would even dare say that some of these same people who were shouting Hosanna and waving the palm branches were the same people in the crowd who then shouted, crucify him. Crucify him. I, I had a dream last night. I'm not sure exactly what it means. But I was, uh, I was a cable man or something, utility guy. I don't know, something. And I went to this house, and they had a little shack out in the back. And I came to this house, and I'm here to fix your problem, and they take me out to this shack in the back. And I'm working in this shack, doing some things, and all of a sudden, this, this little dog comes in. And I mean, it is as ferocious as any dog could be. It's growling at me, baring its teeth, and I got scared. You know how you feel in your dream when you get scared, and all those emotions are popping up, and I got scared, and I started yelling, help, help, somebody come and help me. Well, the owner comes in, who's some kind of middle-aged guy, and then his, his mother comes in, and they're both, they're both in the room with me, and here's this dog, and this dog is going crazy. It's attacking me. It's biting my leg. I'm bleeding, and this guy's sitting there, and he's doing nothing, and the whole time, I'm like, hey, get this dog away from me. Get this thing out of here. And finally, at the end of the dream, I look at him and I said, I, I'm going to have you arrested for kidnapping because you're keeping me here outside of my own will. And I don't know exactly what the dream means. I'm still praying about it. But I will tell you this, that religion and the spirit of religion does the exact same thing. And the spirit of religion is often passed down from one generation to the next. The man and his mother were there, and here's this ferocious thing attacking me, and nobody wants to do anything about it, and it's keeping me in a place of bondage. And this is exactly what religion 
the spirit of religion. You understand religion in a sense is good. But Jesus said the only thing that we should ever be religious about is caring for widows and orphans. You see, I just want to live in freedom. I just want to be free. I don't want anybody coming here and telling me that i got to wear a suit and tie. Now, there may be days where I just show up in a suit and tie. I might just surprise you. I had a dream a few years ago, right when we started this church, and I, I was back here off the stage, and there was like a dressing room back there, and I was picking out clothes. And I found this, I know this is not the best term to use, but it's the only one I know to describe it, but they call wife beaters. You guys know, you know wife beaters? That's the worst name, and I don't know who named them that. But this white, tight tank top, you know? It, and it's all these suits and ties and clothes, and here's this white, tight tank top. And I picked that thing out. And I put this on, and I'm thinking to myself, before I come up on the stage, I'm thinking to myself, what am I doing? This is the most ridiculous thing I could possibly wear on a Sunday morning. People are going to think I'm outside of my mind. But I think what the Lord was trying to say is, listen, just be free. Now, I would never wear one of, I wouldn't wear one of those at home by myself alone. But here I am, just... And we were at a church uh, last Sunday, and there's evangelists there, and we know the pastor, and the evangelist was kind of giving us some prophetic words, and he said to me, he said, you have a very non-traditional church, and the, pastors, the pastor said, yeah, it's, it's, it's non-traditional. And, and I was thinking to myself, you know, the whole focus and the whole point of what we do is just to bring freedom to people. In other words, you have permission to come and be you. Amen. Did you hear me? Amen. With all of your faults, with all of your hang-ups, with all of your baggage, I don't care. But what I do care is that as you come as you, that you are also coming to give your stuff to Jesus. Because the presence of Jesus is going to make a demand on your life. The presence of Jesus is going to demand a response from you. And the response, the appropriate response is, Lord Jesus, here I am. I can't fix myself, but I know that you can. Here's all my stuff, all my junk, all my baggage, but I thank you that you're going to make me better than I am right now. And that your presence is demanding a response from my life. And I am going to step up to the plate and I'm going to answer the response. And I'm going to begin to give you the, those things that I know don't belong in my life so that I can be more like you. Amen. See, the, the Pharisees made church something that it was never meant to be. The temple was supposed to be a house of prayer. They made it a den of thieves. And I would dare say that over the ages, we, in some sense, in some particular areas, we have made church something that it was never meant to be. Instead of church being a place of freedom, it also oftentimes has become a place of judgment. Instead of the church being a place of hope, it's often become a place of hopelessness. Instead of lifting people up and exalting them and putting them in their rightful place in the kingdom of God, it has often been a place of oppression. It has often been a place where we have pulled people down instead of exalting them. See, Saul did the exact same thing. Saul, who was the king over Israel, had David. David, a mighty man of valor, a man after God's own heart. And David begins to go out and slay his enemies. He kills Goliath. We know the story. But when Saul and David are being paraded through the town, the women begin to sing. Saul has slain his thousands, but David has slain his tens of thousands. And what happens? Saul, who's the leader, the king over Israel, gets jealous. But see, this is my pattern of thinking, is that if Saul would have had a kingdom mindset... If Saul's heart would have been right with God, Saul would have known that all of David's victories belonged to him. Because David was in his camp. Come on. When you, when you send the football team, when you, we'll go with softball. When you send the softball team out to play, you put Brendan up to bat, and I saw him bat yesterday. Whew. 
there was, there was some kids, <laughs> there was some kids, teenagers over here practicing, and man, he's just zoom, just, we, we put up a fence, and I'm telling you, the fence is way too short, okay? It needs to be like another 100 feet back, and he's just sending those, we just stopped chasing the ball after a while, it was just like, <laughs> there's another one, we'll go get that in a minute, there's another one. These teenagers are over there, and when I heard one of them say, man, that's going to be me in five years. <laughs> But you understand that when, when Brendan or Joe or whoever's when they're zinging those balls over the fence, the rest of the team isn't getting jealous. Come on. We're not sitting back and saying, oh, they're just a bunch of show-offs. Oh, they, you know, wait till I get up to bat. That's not what the team's doing. The team is cheering them on. Right. Come on, you can do even better than that. Send one out to the river next time. But see, when we come to church, we have an opposite mindset. And when we see people beginning to succeed, instead of pushing them forward and saying, come on, you can do it, you can be even better than that, we want to grab them by the coattails and pull them down and put them in their place and say, listen, don't show off anymore. You're getting too, too far ahead of yourself. And there's a spirit of competition that enters into the house of God. And it's a Cain and Abel all over again. And when Abel begins to celebrate and when Abel begins to be promoted, Cain begins to devise a means in his own heart of how he can destroy his own brother. And I'm telling you this morning that the presence of Jesus wants to bring reformation back to his house. He wants to set things straight. He wants to set things right. He wants us to have a heart that's aligned with his heart so that we see what he sees and that we do what he's doing. When it comes to church, I try to treat the church just like I treat my children. In a sense. How many of you know when you have more than one kid, you just you love them all the same, right? I mean, there they are. There's some that have their little quirks and their little thing that they do, and it drives you nuts. And then there's, there's some things that you, that you just love what they do. And it, it, you, but you just you love them all the same. Everybody gets the same opportunity. Everybody gets the same amount of love. And my philosophy when it comes to church is that we should be that way with each other. That everybody gets the same amount of respect. Everybody gets the same amount of love. Everybody gets the same amount of mercy. That there's no favoritism, so to speak. I don't know. I'm way off in left field here. I don't know how we got here, but here we are. But what I'm simply trying to say is that the presence of Jesus comes to bring us back into right alignment. And that if we're not careful, the spirit of religion and the things that we've learned, we've learned how to do church. We've learned how to look holy. We've learned how to do all these things. And can I say that the Pharisees were in the exact same boat. They learned all of these things through generations and generations. And then Jesus comes and He turns their tables upside down and now they don't know what to do. This isn't what church is supposed to be like. This isn't what the temple is supposed to look like. This isn't what we created. And I would just have to dare say that perhaps not all of our church background and the things that we experience in church is what Jesus wanted. There's a, another story in Luke chapter 4 which is, has some parallel similarities in it. Jesus comes to his own hometown, the place where he grew up. And in verse 17 of Luke chapter 4, it says, So he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed a book of the prophet Isaiah, and when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty. Everybody just say liberty. Liberty, liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. 
Then he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And look at what it says. And all of the eyes of who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. Fixed on him. You see, because for the first time in their life, they heard the word of God being spoken with anointing, with power, with authority. And all of a sudden, there's this awareness. Something is not what here. Some, there's something here that we're not used to. And it's that quiet moment. And they're just waiting for the next thing to happen. And Jesus says, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. The gracious words, it means grace-filled words that proceeded out of his mouth. So here they are. Jesus speaks to them. His presence is there. His authority is there. His anointing is there. And they hear the word of the Lord actually being spoken by the one who is the word made flesh. And there's a pause in their heart and they sit back for a moment and Jesus is waiting for a response. But see, the Bible says that they reasoned in their hearts. One of the other Gospels says they reasoned among themselves. Is this not Joseph's son? What should have been an outbreak of revival, what should have been an appropriate response to Jesus was reasoned away. And they just said, well, this is Joseph's son. We've, we know him. We know his brothers. There's his mom. We know who he is. You see, I believe we pray for revival, but I believe that revival is automatically available to us the moment that we step into the kingdom of God. We want to pray, Lord, bring revival. And I don't even know what revival looks like. What does rev- I, you know, I mean, there's some people here have been to Toronto and Brownsville and other revivals that have happened around the world. I, what does it mean? Does it mean that we all shake and go crazy, run around? Is that revival? I don't know. I don't know. That may be a part of it. And there's nothing wrong with that stuff necessarily. But what I do think revival is, is I think that revival is when the presence of Jesus shows up, demands a response, and we appropriately meet the response by giving him our life. When we're praying for revival, the church is praying for revival. God, send revival. But I think revival is already here. I think revival is Jesus. And I think he showed up twice in both of these stories with revival. And the people wanted, they began to step toward him, they began to, but when Jesus begins to demand a response in their life and demand that they actually change, all of a sudden, it's just Joseph's son, there's his brothers, there's his mother, we're just going to continue on down this road the same way we've been doing it, we're just going to continue to do church the same way we've done it for the last hundred years because it's all we know. Sometimes all that you know, what all that you know, is the very thing that keeps you from excelling and growing into him even more. Come on, jeez, I see it all the time on Facebook, drives me crazy. People calling this guy a false prophet over here, this guy's a heretic. Todd White, we saw him at the conference a couple weeks or months ago, and he's telling us that people are are out in front of his thing, picketing and carrying signs, false gospel, false preacher. But you know what I learned? I learned a long time ago, your your Aunt Juanita can be a false prophet. Now, you don't have an Aunt Juanita. I did, and she she wasn't a false prophet, but that's just just the name I chose to use. You understand, your grandmother can be a false prophet. Your uncle can be a false prophet. A false prophet is the one who gives you false information. A false prophet is the one that leads you astray. And come on, I would dare say that every one of us in this room, including myself, at one time or another has had someone close to us say something, teach us something, show us something that was actually contrary to the kingdom of God. But they took it as truth. 
And we have to guard ourselves. We have to guard our hearts against the spirit of religion. And we have to be very careful sometimes that when Jesus comes, when the presence of Jesus comes, when Jesus demands a response, that we don't always act out of what we've known, what we've learned, what we've been taught. But we respond out of a pure heart that says, Jesus, I want what you want, and I want to become what you want me to become. Let me show you one last thing in Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2 and verse 1, it says, And again he entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And he came to preach the word to them. You know, as a pastor, I get emails and advertisements all the time about church growth. You know, 101 steps to, to grow your church. 101 ways to to make sure that your church is filling up with people. And there's one book that I read a long time ago. They wanted you to count the number of parking spaces that you have out in your parking lot. They want you to count the amount of chairs, you know, because if people come in, they can't find a seat, then they won't come back, and all these other things. But you know what this tells me? In, in these few verses, it tells me that if the presence of Jesus is there, that people will park in the grass. People will park down the street. People will actually sit on the floor. They'll stand at the doorway in order to hear what Jesus is saying. We turn church into an institution when it's supposed to be a family that is centered around the presence of Jesus. Then they came to him bringing a paralytic man who was, car who was carried by four men and when they could not come near him because of the crowd, I love this, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, when they had broken through, they lit down on the bed the one uh, in which the paralytic was laying. Come on, these men are doing all that they can to get their friend to Jesus, even if it means vandalism. Don't you love it when you walk into a bathroom stall at Walmart or something and somebody just scrapes? Scrapes right on the wall, Jesus loves you. You guys never seen that, or am I the only one? Or maybe you've done it, and now you feel guilty. <laughs> you know, breaking the law in order to give an evangelistic message to whoever's going to use that urinal that day, or whatever. I don't, can you say urinal in church? I don't know. <laughs> but these men, these men resort to vandalism. Now you understand that in, in this day and age, in this culture, the, the roof of the house was actually another living area. They, they would actually, uh, uh, you know, go up, it's like a porch, I guess, but it was on the roof. And when these men can't get to the presence of Jesus, they begin to tear apart the structure in order to get their friend to Jesus, because their friend needs Jesus. And see, this is, this is what I want to say to you this morning. That, that all of us in this room, there are things that go through our mind, our background, our culture, where, how we were raised, all of these things. And I'm telling you this morning that sometimes we need to tear apart the structure. Right. Sometimes we have to do some demolition in our own life to get to Jesus. Come on, I'm talking about the real Jesus. I'm not talking about this religious Jesus that we've made up. I'm talking about the Jesus who wants to have a real relationship with you. The Jesus who died on the cross because he loved you that much. I love that song that we sang this morning. God is madly in love with you. And I would say that there's even some of us in this room that still don't believe that. Because we've been taught that God is a punisher. We've been taught that God is angry. You know, the, the, one of the great awakenings in the early days of America was preached by Jonathan Edwards, and the, his message was sinners in the hands of an angry God. And as he would preach, people would even testify that they felt the literal flames of hell licking at their feet. No. No. Theatrics, maybe. 
God can use anything. He used a donkey. Not sinners in the hands of an angry God. Or sinners in the hands of a loving God. For God so loved the world so much that He gave His only Son. That God demonstrates His love to us in that while we were yet sinners, Jesus still died for us. Come on, but how you see God, how you see Him, how you view Him, what you think about Him can be detrimental to your experience with Jesus. Come on, this is the truth. It's just like Adam and Eve. They sinned in the garden, and, and you know the Bible says they were naked and without shame. They sinned in the garden, and then the next few verses, what do we find them doing? Sowing fig leaves together so that they can hide from God because they believe that God is a punisher. Shame. Embarrassment. And it's the one thing that keeps them from the presence of God. And I would dare say that at one time or another, all of us have been guilty of that same thing. Because we don't understand the real nature and the real character of God because somebody over here told us that if we mess up, God's going to strike us with a lightning bolt. If I had a dollar for every time somebody came into the church and said, well, I'm here, the church is going to fall down. Haven't been to church in 10 years, church is going to fall down. I'm here, here I am. And you know, every time they've ever said that to me, not one time have I ever seen the church fall down. Maybe just one time I'd like for it to happen, just so somebody can actually say the church fell down when I showed up. It's not going to happen. Never in a thousand years will it happen. And even if it does happen, it's not going to be because God made it happen. Laura can tell you this in the insurance business, you know, when all the, the wind came and all of our trees fell over, I just, still picking up trees, man, trees tired of trees. Called the insurance company and, you know, was talking to them. What's, you know, when the catastrophe happens or all that, they, it's called an act of God, right? An act of God. Well, I can tell you that God didn't do any of it. Those stupid pine trees don't know how to grow roots, so when the wind comes, they can't stand up. That's the act. It's not even an act of God. That's what happened. But how many of you know we're blaming God for this and that and everything bad that happens and every disaster that comes because we think that's what God's like. And I'm telling you this morning, God is gooder. (laughs) God is good. God is good, period. And if it ain't good, then it isn't God. And if it isn't God, it doesn't belong in your life. And if it doesn't belong in your life, there's actually a way, a pathway to get rid of it. It's through the blood and body of Jesus. And see, these men, they are desperate. They're desperate. They're desperate. And you understand that when you get desperate for God, you are willing to just do about anything to get into His presence. But see, here we have another similar story. Here... Here the men, they lower down the the paralytic on the mat. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. But some of the scribes who were sitting there reasoned in their hearts. You see it. Here it is again. They reasoned in their hearts. Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? See, sometimes reason is our greatest enemy. Sometimes reason is our greatest enemy to break through. And where does reason come from? Reason comes from what we've been taught. It comes from our background. It comes from what we've experienced. And when Jesus begins to do something that's outside of that box, the danger is is that we reason in our own hearts and dismiss a move of God because we don't think that's what God would do. And Jesus does it time and time and time and time again. He comes to the church. He blows it up. But people reason in their hearts. He comes to his own hometown. They experience the anointing for the first time in their life. But they reason in their own hearts. Jesus heals the paralytic man. But they don't understand it. So they reason in their own hearts. And every time they miss an opportunity to respond appropriately to the presence of Jesus. 
And Jesus even says in verse number 8, Why do you reason about these things in your heart? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven? Or to say to you, Arise, take up your bed, and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, He says to the paralytic, I say to you, Arise, take up your bed, and go home. And immediately He rose, took up the bed, and went out. And it says, All were amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this. Come on, this is the experience that I want you to have with God. Where you can say, I've never seen anything like this. I've never felt anything like this. I've never experienced anything like this. But see, in order to have that kind of encounter and that kind of experience with Jesus, you have to appropriately appropriately respond to His presence when His presence comes. And you have to remove all reason and all doubt, all suspicion, all your religious training. I've never seen anything like this. Come on, how many of you want to have that experience? Never saw nothing like this, God. (laughs) What was that? I remember a few years ago, we were at Victory Assembly of God in West Virginia, and we had an evangelist friend of mine came. He he brought a whole team with him, a small team. And we had a, you know, healing meeting, I guess it was. And there was quite a few people there. And I'm the pastor of the church, and he says, he says, if anybody wants a prophetic word, we're going to pray for you. And so I get up to the front, and he's there. There's his friend. I think Krista was over here somewhere. And there's just a line of us right up here, and people just start coming. And one lady comes up to me, and I just put my hand on her shoulder. And all of a sudden, it was like a download you know, we use, we use terms now that they wouldn't have understood 15 years ago. But it was just like all of a sudden there was this knowing. I just had this knowing that she had a son and that that relationship had been violated. And now her and her son were separated. They weren't talking. And I just began to describe to her the situation, like knowing Like, actually, this is what happened. This is what occurred. But this is what God's going to do. And it was the first time as a pastor or even as a believer that I had a word that was that specific. And I was blown away by it. And I said, Lord, I never saw nothing like that before. I never experienced anything like that before. And at the end of the service, I mean, the words that night were, were that precise. Everybody that got a prophetic word, it was that accurate. And at the end of the service, my friend, the evangelist, looks at me and he said, well, we all got an upgrade tonight. And we certainly did. And it doesn't just have to be something like that. It can, whatever the case may be, but I want you to have an experience where you can walk away and say, I never saw anything like that before. I never experienced anything like that before. I didn't know God could even do something like that before. You see, sometimes the greatest obstacle to us experiencing more of God is just right between our ears. The way that we think, the things that we've been taught, the things that we're expecting even. I've seen God heal people, and at the same time I've seen people on the other side saying, oh, God would never heal like that. Listen, sometimes your greatest obstacle is not the devil. I say the only time the devil is ever your greatest obstacle is when you let him be. Sometimes our greatest obstacle is just the way that we think. Just the things that we've been taught. But I believe this morning that Jesus wants to tear your roofs off. He wants to tear down the structure of the way that you think. Because, see, Jesus wants you to have a genuine experience with him. It's not about coming to church and hearing a sermon or singing a song. It's about coming to this place and experiencing his presence. Because that's the only thing that's going to change any of us. It's the only thing that's going to bring healing. It's the only thing that's going to bring deliverance. It's the only thing that's going to bring revival is his presence. So what do you say we get rid of some stinking thinking? 
tear the roof off, tear down the structure, and begin to be like these men with their paralytic friend and be, be willing to do whatever we have to do in order to get to the feet of Jesus. Come on, will you stand? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We bless you, Father. We bless you, Lord. Amen. Come on, God's good, right? I just want you to put your hand on your forehead. Just pray this with me. Jesus, I thank you that you are madly in love with me. And I pray right now that if there's any thought in my mind that's contrary to that fact, that you would expose it and remove it. I bring to you my past, my upbringing, my experiences, and I ask you through the power of the Holy Spirit that you would examine them and bring to the forefront anything that causes me to not experience you in the way that you want to. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Father, I thank you for each and every individual that's here in this room today. And Lord, I thank you that you want all of us to experience more of you. Lord, I thank you that you want to bring revival, that you have brought revival. And Father, today I pray that we would examine our hearts. Lord, that we would respond appropriately to the presence of Jesus. And if there's anything inside of our lives that doesn't belong there, Father, that through the power of the Holy Spirit and the blood of Jesus, you would begin to do the work of cleansing and purifying us right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, that we would stand before you justified, we would stand before you sanctified, that we would stand before you complete, whole and completely forgiven in the name of Jesus. We bless you, Lord. We thank you for it, Father. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. God is so good. Amen. We're going to have some time of ministry here at the end. If you're here this morning, if you're here, I don't know. I know. It's lunchtime. French fries and something. Uh, This is very simple. Two things. If you're here this morning and you have a need in your physical body, you need healing today, we want to pray for you. And secondly, if you're here this morning and the message has been speaking to you, the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, and you want more, you just want to yield things, you want to surrender things to the Lord today, we would love nothing more than to agree with you in prayer. I'm going to ask Krista and Garrett and Nancy to come up. We're just going to agree with you this morning. I don't want to embarrass anybody. We're not here to do that. But I do want to ask uh, Earl Harris if you'll come up. We want to pray for you this morning. He's just got some tests and things that are coming up. We just want to agree with him. Hallelujah. Come on, how many of you know Jesus is a healer? He's a healer. Amen. If that's you, you want prayer this morning, you need healed in your body. You just want to surrender to the Lord. Just make your way forward. We're going to pray for you. Thank you, Jesus. Can we get some men to come up? We're going to pray for Earl here. Levi and Dean. Anybody else?
So, which is the, like, uh, like,